All right, I want to thank you all for coming. I know that there's been some bad weather, and um, it, it just means a lot to me whenever anybody takes some time out of their day to listen to a couple of ideas that I've worked on and put together myself. So I'm just delighted that you're all here. The plan is for me to give a talk for about 30 minutes and then to give opportunity for you to talk yourself and have a discussion for about 30 minutes. Um, and we'll just kind of see. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the time. I have a few slides prepared that we could go to for discussion, but we might go off uh, and not cover what I planned anyway, and that's perfectly fine. Our topic is uh, Let's Be Friends. Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom. Uh, you might think, what's, I didn't realize they weren't friends in the first place. What's the problem here? So, you might ask yourself, why doubt their friendship in the first place? The, one of the oldest passages on this is St. Augustine's On Free Choice of the Will. Um, you can actually go further back and find indications of this kind of argument in Aristotle, uh, but Augustine is the first one that I could find that r does this in the Judeo-Christian tradition and locates the issue directly with God's foreknowledge and human freedom. This is what Augustine writes um, in On Free Choice of the Will. How is it that these two propositions are not contradictory and inconsistent? This is, by the way, the voice of the student. This is a dialogue, so a student discussing with Augustine. The student asks... Augustine, how is it that these two propositions are not contradictory and inconsistent? One, that God has foreknowledge of everything of the future, and two, that we sin by the will and not by necessity. For, you say, if God foreknows that someone is going to sin, then it is necessary that he sin. But if it is necessary, the will has no choice about whether to sin. There is an inescapable and fixed necessity. Let's take a moment, and I'm going to try to reconstruct the argument briefly. So, the issue that's brought up is, how are these two propositions that traditional religious folks like Augustine believe not inconsistent and contradictory? One, that God foreknows everything in the future, and everything should include our free choices. Um, and secondly, that we act by the will and not by necessity. Well, under the assumption, there's another assumption in this that's not too controversial, and that's the idea that whatever God foreknows cannot fail to occur. There's a difference between what I believe about your future events and what, if there is a God, what God thinks about your future events. I might think that tomorrow, uh, you're going to, a lot of my students are here today, so I might think that tomorrow, you're going to come to class. But as occasionally, but not regularly, happens. That, is, that belief is proven false in that I believe you're going to come to class, and then you decide not to come to class. Um, if God believes something of your future, though, it can't be wrong. It must be so. Because God's knowledge is supposed to be different from ours. God's knowledge is supposed to be perfect and infallible. So whatever God foreknows cannot fail to occur, so if you look at propositions one and three, they imply the fourth one, that our future actions cannot fail to occur, that they must, in other words, occur by necessity. Because what you mean by cannot fail um, just might be the, you might just say that's just the same thing as being necessary. Well, when you add to this a sort of benign claim that whatever occurs by necessity is not free, well, then you get our future actions occur by necessity, not by an act of the will. That's bad, because that's directly in contradiction with number two. And so that's something like this is what Augustine has in mind as to why propositions one and two um, may be uh, in contradiction with one another. The solution that I want to give to you is, comes from the 16th century, a Jesuit theologian and philosopher named Luis de Molina. Molina was a student of the great um, counter-reformationist theologian Suarez. And Suarez held many of these similar kinds of views as well. Um, the 
<coughs> one of the key assumptions in the way that I'm going to do this is that there is libertarian free will. Say, okay, what does that mean? Let me give you a couple of quotations from Molina and then flesh this out. So here's a quote from On Divine Foreknowledge. He says, but freedom can be understood in another way, insofar as it is opposed to necessity, in the sense that the agent is free, which, with all the prerequisites for acting posited, is able to act and able not to act or is able to do one thing in such a way that it is also to do some contrary thing. And by virtue of this sort of freedom, the faculty by which an agent is able to act so to act is called free. It follows from this that free choice, if it is to be conceded anywhere, is nothing other than the will in which freedom exists formally, guided by a previous judgment of reason. In another place, a little shorter, he writes this. So, too, in order for there to be merit or for an act to be morally good, indeed, even in order for there to be a free act that is indifferent to moral good and evil, it is necessary that when the act is elicited by the faculty of choice, it be within the faculty's power to elicit it, given all the circumstances obtaining at that time. What, uh, one other quote from an authority, a group, uh, philosopher at Notre Dame, who specializes in... Uh, uh, Molina. Um, oh, I got that after this. So he, here's what you want to see is that first, there's a bunch of themes that come out of this. One is that uh, the source of free action is got to come from an undetermined will. That the will is some kind of unique part of the human, of, of human capacities that is not reducible to or are the same as our desires, our beliefs, um, or any other part of the human psychology or the human self. That the will is an independent and no, irreducible part of the self. And secondly, um, what this shows us is that determinism, the idea that there could be causal forces that necessitate the will to do one thing or to choose another thing, um, that is incompatible with being free. Um, as uh, this guy Ferdoso says, who teaches at Notre Dame and is a specialist in Molina, Molina's conception of freedom is strongly indeterministic. In modern terms, he is an unremitting libertarian. So some of my students are here today, and you, we've been talking about libertarian free will, actually in both uh, my Introduction to Philosophy class and my Philosophy of Religion classes. Um, and this should, be, this should line up with what we're talking about there. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Simmons' students also are starting to t talk yes. about free will. So this should line up with that conception. Um, the other key part to the Molinist solution is this idea of middle knowledge. Before we can understand what middle knowledge is, we have to know what it's between, what is, what is it in the middle of. It's in between two things, God's natural knowledge on the one hand and God's free knowledge on the other. Let's talk about, I'm going to talk about those at first, natural knowledge and then free. God's natural knowledge is described this way by Molina. He says that one type is purely natural knowledge, accordingly and accordingly could not have been any different in God. Though this type of knowledge he knew all the things to which the divine power extended either immediately or by the mediation of secondary causes, including not only the natures of individuals and the necessary states of affairs composed of them, but also the contingent states of affairs. Through this knowledge he knew, to be sure, not that the latter were or were not going to obtain determinately, but rather that they were indifferently able to obtain and able not to obtain, a feature that belongs to them necessarily and also falls under God's natural knowledge. What does that mean? Here's a couple of summary points that, he, that we can take from this. That natural knowledge would consist of God's complete knowledge of all necessary truths, and what we might call conceptual truths. A conceptual truth would be even the idea that, this was what he was getting at the end of that quote, that even in indeterministic situations, if there are such things, 
that God would know that it is necessarily the case that God would know that one possibility could obtain or the other possibility could obtain. Um, and if there are other possibilities, God knows all of the, of the possible things that could take place. So um, these truths are necessarily true. And secondly, these truths are independent of God's will, which means that they are true or false without regard to whether God wills them to be true or false. They are made true or false without regard to God's willing them so. And therefore, they cannot be altered by God. Uh, for instance, all squares have four sides. That would be the kind of truth that would be part of natural knowledge. God could not make it so um, that squares have three sides, because that's impossible. Um, in the same way, the fact that squares have four sides would be true independently of God's will making it so. Um, some people might want to think that's controversial or might want to argue about that or have different views on that. We could talk about that during uh, the, the discussion period. But for now, um, the point is that this is the conception that he's working under. And I would say a relatively acceptable one in philosophy of religion that people work with. Um, God's natural knowledge, all of these things that would fall under God's natural knowledge would all have the same truth values in every single possible world. One way that we define necessarily true in philosophy is that if something is necessarily true, then it is true in every possible world. Um, and in one way that we say that something is impossible is that it is, that statement would be false in every possible world. Um, so, and then the final point I just want to reiterate is that the truth value of these kinds of claims would be fixed, it would be set in place prior to God's will to create any given world. So, after God's natural knowledge is God's free knowledge. God's natural knowledge, like we said, is all these necessarily true things. God's free knowledge would consist then of something of the, almost the exact opposite kind of nature. God's free knowledge is that by which, after the free act of his will, he knew absolutely and determinately, without any condition or hypothesis, which ones from all the contingent states of affairs were, in fact, going to obtain, and likewise, which ones were not going to obtain. So here's what the, this is getting at. Free knowledge, then, is the knowledge of all the contingent truths about the world. Um, these truths would depend upon God's will. So in other words, whether these things are true or false would depend upon which world God decides to create. Um, maybe the model you're supposed to think about is, imagine this is a little bit misleading um, because of the nature of space, time, and God, but this might help, which is that imagine that God, before he creates anything, kind of is by himself, and he's just kind of hanging out doing his God thing. And then God, when, once he decides to create a certain world, because he could create the world in a lot of different ways, but once he decides to create a certain world, it makes it, after he does that, let's say in one world, just to be real arbitrary, he creates a world with three planets, and another world he could create with has four. Either one, so in the state of natural knowledge, God knows it is possible to create a world with three planets, and he knows it is possible to create a world with four planets. But um, it's not until he says, all right, I'm going to create the world with four planets, that boom, it now becomes the case that it is now true, contingently, that there are, there's a universe with four planets in it. So in that sense, because God chose to create that universe with those planets, these truths become dependent on God's will. It wouldn't be true that there is a universe with four planets in it if God didn't choose to bring that about. So the truth value of these propositions are fixed logically after God's will to create the world. Notice the parallel here. So in natural knowledge, these, no these truths are necessary, and the truth value of those claims is set prior to God's will to create anything. But in free knowledge, 
These are knowledge of contingent truths, and the truth value of those propositions are fixed after God's will to create a specific world. Middle knowledge fits between the two. So, here, here's the idea of middle knowledge. It lies between God's natural knowledge, which is made true logically prior to his decision to create some world, and God's free knowledge, which is made true after God's decision to create some world. So here's the quote from Molina. Finally, the third type is middle knowledge, by which, in virtue of the most profound and inscrutable comprehension of each faculty of free choice, he saw in his own essence what each such faculty would do with its innate freedom, were it to be placed in this or in that, or indeed in infinitely many orders of things, even though it would really be able, if it so willed, to do the opposite. This is the cool stuff. So, middle knowledge is, consists of what you might call, what philosophers, who cares what you might call it, philosophers who write on this have decided to call these counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. Sometimes it's abbreviated as just CCFs. Counterfactuals of creaturely freedom um, follow this kind of formula, the truth values that would be ascribed to these kinds of statements. If subject S were put in circumstances C, then S would freely perform action A in C. So in other words, it would go something like this. Suppose you do have this kind of libertarian free will that we talked about a couple slides back, where you are not causally determined to make the choices that you make. Uh, to give a silly kind of example, the choice to pick what flavor of ice cream that you want. So you go into an ice cream parlor, you've got the choice, let's just make it real simple between um, strawberry ice cream and chocolate cookie dough, chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream. A hard choice for me. In that circumstance, if you have libertarian free will, nothing in, that, in the circumstances necessitates that you must pick chocolate chip cookie dough or strawberry. You could pick, um, it is causally possible for you to bring about either one. What will bring it about? Whatever your will decides in an undetermined way. <coughs> So, this is what God knows. Before any individuals are created, he knows what would happen if he were to create Lori, put her in the ice cream shop in those circumstances, and gives her free will. He knows that she could possibly do either one, but that she will choose cookie dough. Cookie dough. So, God knows this not just about Lori and the ice cream shop. You know, he knows what, he, what Lori would choose to do in any circumstance that she would be created in with free will. And not just for Lori, but for Melanie, for Bill, for Aaron, <coughs> for Phil. Yeah, they all kind of rhyme. The idea here <laughs> is that um, God, and not just for you folks, and not just the people here, not just the people who inhabit Earth now, and who have ever inhabited Earth, and ever will inhabit Earth, but also individuals who never will exist. So if you could have, sometimes I wonder, I have a sister, and that's my only sibling. What if my parents would have had a brother? Or would have had a son, another son? What would have he been like? What choices would he have made? I don't know. But according to Molina, God does. That God knows all the different possible individuals who could have existed, he knows all the circumstances you could place them in with free will, and he knows what they would do with that free will if, given, if put in those circumstances. And you could extend this beyond free will even to things like electrons, if you like. Um, for science people in the room who, who say, I don't care about free will, I care about the electrons. Well, the electrons get to play with this too, because if electrons are not determined whether they are going to you know, spin left or spin right, I guess that's more for the quarks, but... Uh, if it's indeterministic, the laws of physics don't necessitate that the electron will go this way or that, or that the quark will spin up or down. God knows that if that quark were put in those circumstances, that it, what it would do. I think that's pretty cool, too. <coughs>
So propositions that God knows through his middle knowledge are known logically prior to his will to create anything. So these are things that God cannot will to be one way or another without violating free will. God can't just decide, well, I'm going to create Lori, put her in the ice cream parlor, and make her pick strawberry. If God does that, then Lori no longer has free will. God did it for her. So God knows prior to creating Lori, the, in a sense, the kind of person that Lori is, and knows and knows her essence so well that he knows how she will use her free will under these kinds of circumstances. So God has no control over the truth values of these counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. If it turns out that every single kind of creature that God could create with free will happens to use that free will to do nasty things, God can't do anything about that. So whatever God knows through middle knowledge is such that it is possible still that he could have known the contrary thing. Once again, if he creates Lori, puts her in the ice cream parlor, and gives her the choice to, do, to have chocolate chip cookie dough or um, strawberry, he might know that she will pick the chocolate chip cookie dough, but he also knows that she could still have chosen the other thing. There's nothing about that scenario that causally necessitates her choosing the chocolate chip cookie dough. So to bring it all together, how does this show that divine foreknowledge is compatible with human freedom? Middle knowledge does this because it lies between God's natural knowledge, which is independent of God's will, and God's free knowledge, which is dependent on his will. So while God can't control the outcome of the choices that are made by these free creatures, he can control which, free, which creatures exist, if any of them do, and the circumstances under which they will make choices. So, God's foreknowledge of human actions consists of knowledge that is in some sense both dependent, because, which is important because it didn't depend on him, he couldn't know it ahead of time, and in some sense, independent, which is good, because if it wasn't independent of him entirely, you couldn't be free. And so, therefore, God's foreknowledge of our choices can still be free. Um, and it can be under his control. You get both out of this. Um, here's a big quote from Thomas Flint, another uh, Notre Dame philosopher. This guy, Molina, is kind of a big hit at Notre Dame. And Thomas Flint, um, in, in one of his... Uh, major books on Molinism writes that the problems of foreknowledge and sovereignty are solved on this picture due to the fact that God's foreknowledge of contingent events flows from a combination of knowledge beyond his control and decisions under his control. Because he has middle knowledge and makes free choices concerning which creatures will exist in which circumstances, God has both complete foreknowledge concerning how those creatures will act and great control over their actions in the sense that any action they perform is either intended or permitted by him. Yet, because the knowledge which generates this foresight and sovereignty is not itself a product of divine free activity, our actions remain genuinely free, not the robotic effects of divine causal determination. Um, here's an another way to think about this. Um, and as I'm looking at the time, I know in the, and I want to say something real fast about <coughs> the plan of things. I know I said something in the, hand, or in the announcement about open theism and divine timelessness. Um, I'm probably going to just save those, and if you're interested in that, I've got stuff to say on it. I've got cool slides prepared for them, too. So just let me know it, during our discussion period if you want to bring those up. But to bring it all home, let me just say this is one way to think about what's going on with Molinism. Under Molinism, you have, in a sense, almost like three stages to God's knowledge. Now, it's probably incorrect for us to think about these stages as temporal stages. It's not like in one moment God only has natural knowledge, in the second moment God has middle knowledge, and in the third temporal moment God has free knowledge. But it's better to think of these as... if this makes sense, and maybe it doesn't, which could be a problem, is the idea of logical moments of his knowing. 
but all temporally simultaneous. So in the first moment is God's natural knowledge. This would consist, once again, of all those things that are necessarily true, things that are true in all possible worlds, and it would also include a statement, it would also include knowledge of every possible thing that could take place. Um, and this knowledge is independent of his will. These kinds of true statements are, uh, the true and false statements are true and false, whether God wills these worlds to exist or not. And so the kind of way I've done this, there's a lot of worlds that, uh, that would, God would know here. God knows, one way to put this is that God knows every single logically possible world, or every, any world, any set of events that could logically consistently hang together and create a world. Uh, the second stage would be God's middle knowledge. And this would be the things we just talked about, where God knows not just the possibilities of what would take place, but what actually would take place if he were to decide to create creatures with indeterministic free will. So, in God's natural knowledge, he knows that if he creates Adam in the Garden of Eden, that it is, if Adam has free will, that Adam can choose to sin, or Adam can choose not to sin. Under God's middle knowledge, if we, if we take Genesis uh, 2 and 3 as authoritative for this, that if God creates Adam in the Garden, then he knows that even though he could possibly not sin, he actually does sin. Now, in the third stage is then when God, after God says, of all the different worlds he could create, of all the worlds where he could put in free creatures with free will, knowing all the actual results that would take place if they were created, when God has that array of worlds in front of him and he says, I want that one. Once God wills and says, this is the world I shall create, then we get, boom, God's free knowledge. And these are, all, these are the truths that are contingent. They don't have to be true. But um, whether they obtain is dependent upon God's will. And so this gives us then knowledge of the actual world. Um, what I want to do now is open this up for discussion. Um, so we've got about 30 minutes. Um, what I'd like to do is actually prioritize and give students kind of a first say in this. And then I'll let, I'll let the faculty tear me apart. So, um, what would you like to talk about? <coughs> yeah. Is Jeff. the um, is the concept of natural knowledge where it says um, uh, these tr these truths are independent of God's will? Is that conflicting with the concept of God's omnipotence? So, what seems inconsistent? I want you. To, I think I know what you're thinking, but say a little more. What's inconsistent about that? Because if the truths are independent of God's will, that would imply that one, God didn't create them because He couldn't have because they're independent of God, and two, that God can't alter them in any way, which means that a God is not omnipotent. Yeah. So, like a truth like all squares have four sides, um, that one plus one equals two, that all bachelors are unmarried. These are the kinds of, among the kinds of things that would fit under God's natural knowledge. And the threat would be, if God didn't, if God, if these things are set independently of God's will, how can he be omnipotent? He's sort of locked into these things. Mm -hmm. The usual response that people give is that omnipotence is not, among the things that we don't, that we typically don't think omnipotence applies to are necessary truths. So to think that God could create a square that is n not four-sided is not a, weak, a limitation on his powers because it's not a, a thing at all. It's, in, it's impossible. It's incoherent. Um, so God's inability to do the impossible, God's inability to do the incoherent or the absurd is no limitation on his power is what the typical response is. Okay. Um, a few philosophers have thought otherwise, though. I should maybe eke this out, which is a... a a little-known philosopher named Rene Descartes, um, <laughs> he thought that God could even make squares that didn't have four sides. Um, and there's a lot of debate about this in the philosophy of religion, but the mainstream view is the one I mentioned. Jesse? Um, now, would this uh, contradict the idea that God is benevolent in the sense that... Uh, there's obviously evil in the world, and if God were to create this world rather than not 
create any world at all with that. This is an interesting point. Um, this very idea of middle knowledge actually came into a great resurgence in the 1970s in philosophy, largely because of the problem of evil. Um, a philosopher named Alvin Plantinga wrote a book called The Nature of Necessity, and a follow-up to that called God, Freedom, and Evil, where he argues that he uses this idea of middle knowledge to actually absolve God of the problem of evil and is not universally but very widely recognized of having pretty much dispatched the, what's called the logical problem of evil. Now, this does raise other issues, so let me first explore one way that, you, that people tend to think about this, which is, but wait a minute, if God knows all of the actions or all the choices we could make with our free will, and of all the different worlds, of all the individuals that could exist, and he created this world? where we know that some people have done some pretty awful things and continue to do some pretty awful things, doesn't that impugn God's character? Um, here's the other side of that argument. Maybe, for all we know, this is about as good as it gets. It's perhaps, for all we know, the case that given all the, given all the different free choices individuals could make, uh, if God's not going to violate our free will, maybe, um, for all we know, people given free will would do much worse things than what we find in this world. Um, and this relates then into, I mean, the question then becomes, is it logically impossible that God would create a world like this and, and that be uh, inconsistent with his uh, perfect goodness and power and knowledge? And the answer is, that is usually raised by this is, well, it's not impossible. Now, the next thing that we probably think about more is, well, forget about that broad language of possibility and impossibility. What about probable? And if we're going to talk about probability, I think that that takes us to sort of a different kind of discussion then. That at least what I would want to, as far as I would want to take this to the problem of evil is just to bring up the idea that it, for all we know, um, it could be the case that for all the free creature, for all the creatures that God could create, and under any circumstance that they exist, it just might turn out that at some point in their lives they do something nasty and evil. Does that speak to what you were saying? Okay. Um, others? Anyone? You know, I'll let. Yeah. How um, is it proven that we have free will if God created us or God created the person and he created that person to already have a predisposition of what they're going like to do? Like yeah. Like. So this is, I do have something kind of ready for this, right? This almost <laughs> looks like God is kind of like a puppet master still, which is not, we typically think that's a bad thing. <laughs> Um, a philosopher named William Hasker, who does not like m middle knowledge, thinks that this is a big problem. Um, so the objection goes something roughly like this. Although God isn't directly in control of our choices, he still is in control of the circumstances in which humans make those choices, and he knows what choices we will make. And so you still say, well, how can I, I still don't feel like I'm very free under these circumstances. You know, as maybe another way to put it is, if God creates me with knowing my essence in this way, it seems to look like I really don't have free will. And here's the way to remember to keep this in mind is that Molinists are not compatibilists. Um, I have a little I could say more about compatibilism. Um, the very brief idea behind compatibilism is that free will is consistent with causal determinism. Um, but Molinists affirm what we talked about earlier, libertarian free will. So the wrong way to think about this would be to say that the person's character and the circumstances necessitate or cause their choice. That is not what libertarians believe. The circumstances and the person's character do not necessarily cause the outcome of the choice one way or the other. It is still the person's choice that they chose to do this rather than that. So, the idea, I don't know if this entirely speaks to what you're saying, but the response might be something like, that only is a problem if you think that God creating us in this way made us make that choice. 
But remember that the truths of middle knowledge are independent of God's will. So that he didn't create you to make that choice. You would, you would, it was a fact, it was true that you would make that choice prior to your existence um, and prior to God's willing anything about you. Actually, I have one. I have two questions, I guess. But one sort of a point of clarification. Yeah. Um, it was in actually in response to your question. Um, so, a lot of the examples about well, here's what God uh, can't do. Um, a lot of the traditional examples are well, he can't sort of violate these rules of logic, right? So uh, he can't make uh, you know a square have three sides or something like that. But I thought you had said that another thing that he can't do is he uh, can't change our will or something like that. That, that so I just, this seems like a different kind of example. Are you then saying that what we choose to do is sort of in the same category as things like that squares must have four sides, so that that it's logically impossible that we could have made a different choice, and so that's why. Um, God is not capable of interfering. So here's the difference. That's a good, really good question. Um, things. Here's the difference. Squares that have four sides, and all bachelors are unmarried, and the uh, you know two plus three equals five. These statements are true in every possible world. There's no possible world where that where those statements could be false. But free will example, the examples of free will would still be ones that God knows that it is possible for you to have free will in one world under these circumstances and you do one thing, and for you to have free world in a very similar world with the same circumstances but you do the other thing. So there, in God's natural knowledge, God would know that it is possible for you to have free will and do one thing and possible for you to have free will under those same circumstances and do the other. The only thing that, that is fixed that, isn't, that God couldn't alter is which, which choice you actually make. Because when you choose, when you make a free choice, you obviously, under most of these circumstances, can't do both things. You have to do one or the other. So God knows the fact, well, put in those circumstances and you've got to do one. Which one do you, in fact, choose to do? He knows that must be so. And the must there is only that God can't alter that. Um, but he's, so it's different, I don't know if it, this, so the point would be it's different in that God still knows possibly you could choose otherwise. Does that speak to, to that I think point? so. My other concern is just that um, it sounds like, so God, if God knows what choices we're going to make, right, um, then it sounds like our choices are inevitable. That if, if he knows what one we're going to make, then that is the one we're going to make. Right. And so, but there is a concern that inevitability mm -hmm. is incompatible with having free will, if, especially for a libertarian. If I have free will in the libertarian sense, then it has to have been within my power to have made a different choice. And so I wonder how that's compatible with this idea that, well, God knows which one you will choose. You have a follow-up on that? or that, I, I actually did have a question about that, too, because it makes sense because when you say, um, whatever the God knows cannot fail to occur. So even if he knows that there's another possible world where you might have chosen something different under the same exact circumstances, the fact is that he knows that with the circumstances that you're in, in that world that you're in, you're going to make that choice. So I think the concept of inevitability is a good one to bring up because then that would mean we're not free because it's inevitable that because of the world and the situations we're in, we have no other choice but to make that decision. Yeah. Here's the way to, to, that, they, that you should approach this, this part, and maybe this won't be satisfying, but it goes something like this, that what God knows is that you will freely do this. So he doesn't know that you necessarily do it. He knows that you do it by your own free will. And furthermore, God knows, as I said before, that you possibly could still do something otherwise. It's just that you, in fact, did this thing. So... Um, maybe there's a little bit of an analogy here. There's a view called Occamism that really would push this a lot further. So if you're interested in following up on this, this brilliant guy named William of Occam, where it'd be like, suppose you took a videotape of somebody performing a free action. Um, and then, uh, let's say, you know, it's Lori getting her cookie dough ice cream. 
after you get the videotape, let's say you don't know which thing she's done yet, and you're trying to decide, you know, you're going to put the tape in, and you want to know which one did she do. Um, the tape, it's already settled what choice she will make. But if it was a free choice, the fact that it's sort of already known doesn't change that fact. Mm -hmm. What the tape is, it's a record of what free choice was in fact done at that time. The, God's knowledge about our free choices would be like that, sort of in a totality, that God knows that um, what free choice you would make under these circumstances. So there might be some sense in which it's inevitable but the other thing to think about is this, though, is that what makes that you choose this choice rather than the other one is you. That God just knows what thing you would do with your free will. He didn't cause the will to go that, this way or that. Yeah, Melanie, and then I'll get to Rose. Does that imply that God is then timeless instead of eternal? I know you said you had slides on it and you didn't get to it. But it, if, if it's... It sounds to me like, uh, like he's kind of a master profiler. You know, <laughs> like instead of being a puppet master, he just he knows so well what everybody's going to choose. But then what you just described really kind of resonated with me that if he knows it as if it's already happened before it's happened, then does that mean that he sits outside of time? Not necessarily. So Molinists, some believe God is outside of time, like uh, this guy Ferdoso I quoted. There's a Molinist uh, named uh, William Lane Craig. He thinks God is in time. The thing to think about with foreknowledge or with divine timelessness is that often we think that God needs to be outside of time to know the future. That is only on the view that the way that God acquires knowledge of things is perceptual. That somehow if he weren't able to like step back and see it, he wouldn't know it. But I think that's actually a mistake. And if on certain ways of thinking about God, um, sort of an Anselmian perfect being theology, the idea would be that it would actually be better if God knew things in a more direct and immediate way than having to inferentially come to know things through perceiving it. And so if God has, uh, on the view that God is in time, a view that I support, God doesn't know the future because he perceives it, he knows it because he's omniscient. It's just a basic faculty of God's knowledge, of, uh, of how God knows everything. In the same way, we don't expect a mediation for how God is omnipotent. Like, well, God would have to have really strong arms. It would have to have you know, these media, mediating abilities to bring about uh, his powers. We, don't th we just think God is able by an immediate use of his powers to do things. I think omniscience should be thought of similarly, that he doesn't have to have some mediation of his knowledge, he can just immediately exercise that. Um, is God's inability to perform illogical acts similar to his inability to perform immoral ones because goodness is part of his very being? It might be. So um, if this is, if you think about the Euthyphro dilemma as we did in our class, one, the way that I might have suggested that some have tried to solve that is by putting goodness within God's essential nature so that God wouldn't be able to do something evil. Um, and in, under that, if that model, that's exactly right. Doing, God doing evil would be very, just like God's inability to um, make a four-sided triangle. But um, there are other views out there that think that maybe, uh, that, that maybe it is, there's a sense in which God, it is possible for God to do evil. He just never does it. Um, and I, I lean more to the first position myself, but I find, uh, at times, I find the second one worth flirting with. <laughs> yep. So is it to say that God wouldn't be God if he did those other things? Which things are we talking about? Like, now? did illogical things or performed immoral acts? Because by God, by his nature, does not do those things. It's I like if a teacher was hired to, do a, to teach a class and then never showed up to class. He wouldn't be a teacher if he never... Unless he has tenure. Oh! Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I would say that the, the, the impossible things, I would say God couldn't even, no, nobody can do those, not even God. But with the evil things, if it were, if there is a sense in which it is possible for God to do it, the minute that he would perform such an evil thing, he would cease to be God. That's one of the problems with this other view, is that it allows for that possibility that God could cease to be God. <laughs> 
people don't like that of consequence. Yeah. Um, yeah, I um, am, am trying to try to imagine what it would uh, be like to know what somebody's going to do apart from knowing the the causes of what that, that person's going to do. And the difficulty I have with free will is it seems to require acting without a cause. I mean, you know, so we, so mm -hmm. we have a otherwise causal I mean, you know, universe and so I'm trying to imagine that like the like the movie example, I mean, uh, well, just set the movie example aside. So I, I so I'm just I'm imagining like all these patterns would be in place that would cause the person to act. And uh, if especially if he knows all that in advance, then what does he know? It seems what he would have to know is all of the causal factors that went into making that mm -hmm. person act a certain way, and that just seems like uh, determinism to me. Uh, so this is, a, in essence, a question that gets to the heart of libertarianism. Like, is it even coherent to think about this? Um, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two brief things to say about it. One is that I think the 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 re the reality of a kind of indeterministic free will makes a lot more sense to us today than it made a hundred years ago under Newtonian physics. That we're finding out more and more that the physical world itself doesn't operate according to causally determined laws. Now, you might hold out hope, like Einstein did, and say, look, God doesn't play dice, and that they're with the end of the, you know, come back to me in 200 years, and we will have those deterministic laws. But what we're finding more and more is that the universe keeps getting weirder and weirder as we go further down, and I think that it seems like the idea of, their act of indeterminism being a reality is something that we are more, more comfortable with and makes a little bit more sense even under scientific models of causation. Now, that's of course not to say we, that wouldn't prove we have free will. That's just to motivate the idea that indeterminism makes a little bit more sense than it once did. Um, the other thing is the only... It, in my view, the only really good evidence we can have of this kind of libertarian free will is the fact that we've done it. Is the fact that you've had free choices and you've exercised your free will. And you have to rem remember or imagine that you're in one of these really hard scenarios where you exercise your free will, where you're given that choice. Um, in my classes, one of my favorite examples is to talk about where you're driving to school and you're going through Dunmore and you're running late and you accidentally sideswipe one of the cars that's parked out there. And you say, oh my gosh, I you know, hit the car, you look, nobody saw, nobody's around. There might be that moment where you really could do one thing or the other. You know, you have to make a decision pretty quickly. Um, you're either going to drive off or you're going to stop and leave the note. But you've got reasons to do both ways. And you've got desires that pull you in both ways. Ultimately, which thing you do is just, ba I would argue, I can't demonstrate, I can't prove, but I would ask you to imagine it in your own self is just you made that choice. Now, you can always argue that the desires and the beliefs, whatever you ended up doing, that's just those desires and beliefs won the day. But... I think when we're in that moment of making that choice, that's just not, we don't think of it like that. It's not what we experience. It's not what we do. What we think is we are the active ones who make it happen, not that it happens to us. So have I thoroughly answered your, your thing? Probably not. But that's, that's the kind of thing we libertarians tend to say. Okay. Let me go to a new voice. Yeah. I, I come to this hoping to hear something um, that would pull me out of my atheism. But if I were confronted with two flavors of ice cream, and 
vanilla and chocolate for lack of a better. Sure. And I mean, I really like vanilla and I really like chocolate. But then something happens because I can't stand there all day and I really want some ice cream. So if something happens, I make a choice. To me, it's like this thought comes out of nowhere. You know, like I didn't, I don't, I'm not writing down a logical mm-hmm. schematic to figure out which one I should choose. But that thought comes and I pick one. You know, the, the thought of chocolate, boom. Now, the thing about free will is I'm making a choice, but I really don't know where that thought to pick chocolate came from. You know, I really don't know. Just like uh, people commit crimes, murder, and um, maybe they had the choice, well, should I, should I or shouldn't I? But then comes the thought, I'm going to do it anyway, I don't care. You know, for me, I struggle with that as some kind of free will. Yeah. You know, I struggle with that because we really don't know where that thought, that thought that tips the balance and then we act on it. Yeah. I don't know if we really know where that comes from. This is one of the interesting things about some of the recent findings, especially in neuroscience and in uh, empirical psychology about these choices. Uh, there's a researcher, I think he's, he may have recently passed away, Benjamin Libet, and he did these experiments that tried to to give an empirical test to see if we have free will. So he did uh, these things, it was a really simple thing where you had you looked at a, a clock as it was ticking and you at some point just say to yourself if you're going to move your finger, very simple action. And what they, what his experiments found was that there was kind of, and so you're supposed to take note when you're looking at the clock when you made your choice, at what point, you know, if it was at second, you know, 10 or 15 or whatever. And they found that there was sort of a surge of brain activity like about a second or two before the person said, all right, I made my choice. Right. I've read it's even up to like seven or ten seconds before you, you're aware that you make the choice. And so there, there seems to be some precondition, uh, some, some stuff that might indicate that there is some, something causal going on here. The other thing, though, to think about, I mean, Lebet himself did not reach that conclusion. He thought that actually this supported a kind of, uh, it seemed like a, a kind of libertarian free will, that even though there was the surge, the surge wouldn't necessarily show what choice you made. It just showed you were about to make a choice. When I, with the examples you give, I would, be, I would agree with you that I would hesitate to call those free choices if you just kind of have a thought strike you and you act on it. <coughs> My own view, and there are of course lots of different views about this, but is that we can act for reasons, but the reasons incline us without necessitating the choice. So you may have reasons in the example I gave to stay and leave the note on the car, and you may have reasons also to go and, uh, and not leave the note. But either way, it's not as if it happens without reason, it happens with reason still. Very good question. And Follow up. Well, the um, you know, we keep saying that, uh, it, it seems like you're creating this dichotomy that it either has to be necessary or it can be free. But it seems to me that scientific, uh, you know, the laws of natural science are not necessary. I mean, uh, but yet they follow a, a causal pattern. Um, and I mean, and it could be that way with us. I mean, it's not necessary I choose one thing over the other. Right. But it just so happens that the way the causal chain works, I go this way rather right. than that. And the fa- and the, the idea that I that I I don't know where it comes from, or I don't know which one I'm going to choose, doesn't necessarily isn't decisive because um, it could be that it's extremely complex. I mean, the re- the reasons that we make choices can uh, it, it seems to be. Uh, a combination many times of, uh, you know, in, environmental circumstances at the time, you know, s- synchronic and, and diachronic, uh, you know, through time right. uh, circumstances, as well as brain chemistry in particular, hormones and, uh, you know, all kinds of things could go into uh, the, 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 mm-hmm. the, 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 up to the second or the mini second when it, 
that decision is made. But this it still is not free. Good. Um, this is what I, you're right. So it's still, like I would agree with you that there could be indeterministic laws that even, you know, de that are, so to speak, determining our behavior or that operate on our brains that cause us to, ha to have the, perform the behaviors we perform. All that I want to hold on to is the idea that if there is an, if the laws of physics are indeterministic, that creates space now for the possibility that they don't cause the, the outcome of the events, but, but the self does or that the will does. But I wouldn't want to identify the will, of course, with the idea that, well, there's indeterministic statistical laws and those <coughs> things cause your will to go one way or the other. Um, can I, and maybe this is more of the point you're, you're making is that, well, how can you rule that out? And I really, I really don't know how to rule that out except to say, once again, think about your experience of making free choices and they, the choices don't happen to you, you make them happen. Well, one, one, one tiny little thing is that is what I started out trying to aim at was that I can't understand how if God knows the choices, what God could know if it wasn't these patterns. I see. You know what I mean? I mean, how... Yeah. I mean, that's, what I, that's where the original... In, uh, One of the... Came from. Yeah, follow up? Yeah, I just want to just throw this in to connect this with the real world. We send people to jail. Right. We send people to their deaths because of our understanding of the choices that they made. You know, if, if, if an insane person commits murder, then we look at that in a totally different That's way. Right. They were having hallucinations, blah, blah, blah. So they're not responsible for what they... But if someone who's a little bit more like us commits a crime, then we, we, we figure, well, they had a choice to either do it or not do it. Right. And they went and chose to do it. And I would say that we really don't know what happened. But we send people to prison for making choices, you know, but we really don't know. I mean, are they any more free to make a choice than the insane person, you know? Yeah, and students from my intro class, I mean, we read a philosopher named Baron uh, de Holbach, and Holbach actually draws this very point that the sane people and the insane people, basically the only difference from them on his view, because he's a determinist, is the starting point. <laughs> To, and I think that's, that's why we cherish libertarian free. why I cherish libertarian freedom is I think it is necessary for there to be punishment that is justified. To, to Phil's point about, sort of, I think what I took Phil to be saying was like, what's the basis for God knowing this? And that is, is a difficult question. Um, I don't have a great answer to this one either. What I would say is, um, if God is omniscient, he would just as a basic ability know everything that there is a truth value for. Omniscience implies if there's a, a proposition that is either true or false, God knows whether to give it a T or an F, or to recognize it as having a T or F. Counterfactuals of creaturely freedom, I don't know how God knows them. All that I know is that if he's omniscient, he does. At the same, I don't know in exactly, I know generally how my car works, but I know that my car works. Um, that's all I need to know to drive it. Human beings, maybe God has not given us enough knowledge to be able to figure out how God knows everything. And I would venture to guess if there is a being like God, his knowledge would vastly outstrip ours. So it's probably no surprise that we don't know everything about how God knows things. All we need to know is that if he's omniscient, he does know these things. Maybe one last question. Last call. <laughs> Questions are half off. Yeah. <laughs> 30 seconds. Well, thank you all for coming. I enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. I'll see you all right.